Welcome back. I'm Brian Stelter. Let's turn now to Donald Trump and his treatment of the press. Take a look at this breaking news uh, from Esquire magazine. This story published overnight. It says the Trump administration may look to evict the press corps from the White House. Uh, now, this is a little bit more complicated than the headline makes it sound. Uh, there is conversation going on uh, between uh, Sean Spicer, who I just spoke with uh, via email here, uh, telling me there is conversation about looking for a new setting for press conferences and for news briefings, the daily briefings that the current White House administration has. Uh, Spicer's basically saying maybe the room's too small, maybe we need room for more journalists. Uh, but there's a deeper, deeper concern among White House correspondents and others about exactly how Trump is going to approach this. You know, let's be honest, he's being aided, egged on, and encouraged by conservative commentators like Sean Hannity and Republicans like Newt Gingrich, uh, who want Donald Trump to just ignore and dismiss the press. Listen to what Newt says here on Fox. Journalism's dead. Did Donald Trump bury them today? Well, I he didn't bury him today, but he, he certainly, I think, began to draw the lines for the fight that's coming. They can close down the elite press. They can create totally new venues for informing the American people. They can go to Facebook and to YouTube and to Skype, and they can have average citizens asking questions. Uh, you know, I think you, you could have a, you'd have a much richer dialogue if you broke up the monopoly of the elite news media. Sean, journalism is not dead. Just ask Fox's journalists. Uh, and as for what Gingrich said about breaking up the elite news media, uh, let's talk about that with Jeffrey Goldberg. Back with me, editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, Margaret Sullivan, media columnist for The Washington Post, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, and David Zerowick, media critic for The Baltimore Sun. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, these reports this morning about changes to the press briefing room. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of curiosity. I think that's exactly how the incoming administration wants it. Uh, wanting journalists to be back on their heels, to be on edge about this. What's your take? Well, my take is that for, for generations, uh, presidents have allowed, and it's, the, the word is allowed, allowed the press corps to have space within the White House uh, itself. Uh, it's an important signal to the country that this is the people's house. It's an important signal to the, to, to the press that we treat you with respect and you're an integral part of governance. Uh, you, you are here to, to, to check us. Uh, the press has never felt as free as it wants to feel in terms of wandering around the White House. But mm -hmm. the optics here of moving the press out of the White Look, no one wants... No one wants a battalion of reporters living on their first floor, except maybe you. You would probably have that in your house. But most I people would. don't want. You would, would. But most people wouldn't. But it, this is the price that you pay to have a, 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 to have a, a, a free country, a, a democracy, a, a system of checks and balances, informal and formal. And so the optic of moving them out to some other more distant part of the White House complex is just, is just terrible, in my opinion. Uh, I've posted a full story about this on CNN.com. You all can see the reporting from, from Jim Acosta and Jeffrey Di uh, Jeremy Diamond and I. But, but, MZ, let me go to you on this. You, you know, what I see the Trump administration doing is, is trying in a very purposeful way to disrespect the press. Uh, and that is something perhaps many of Trump's voters like to see. Right. There is this larger context where our profession, unfortunately, has very low credibility with Republicans in particular. I think only 14 percent of Republicans trust the media, only 30 percent of independents, much higher favorability and trust ratings with Democrats. That's a really dangerous thing. We need to hold we need to hold Trump accountable, but we don't really have the credibility to do that. And uh, so he's exploiting that situation. And I think it's really incumbent upon us to really get our house in order and think about how to cover him so that we will be in a position to hold him accountable. Right now, it seems like much of our reporting is designed to whip half the country into a frenzy and get the other half to tune out. We need to kind of buckle down and, and figure out what are the appropriate battles to fight and what are the appropriate lines of questioning so that we can regain credibility with our people. You say designed. You think it's intentional? Um, is what intentional? Sorry. Uh, to be, have a reporting that tears the country apart. Oh, I, I mean, I, there are all sorts of reasons why we've gotten to the point we're in and certainly um, Donald Trump provokes this response in people, but it doesn't really matter. It's our it's our credibility on the line. It's our profession that we need to uphold, and we are just not doing a good job. The more we freak out, it's it just comes like we're having a temper tantrum instead Where's of doing our job. Where's the freaking out? Where's the freaking out happening? I mean, you're seeing it 
just in the general tenor, the Twitter conversations or whatnot, but even in the press conferences and whatnot, we really need to think about how we're going to pursue questioning, how we're going to deal with an administration that does a very good job of avoiding precise language, and also just showing some good faith efforts. I don't think that the media community has responded to our failures of 2016 with any sort of meaningful self-reflection, systematic changes, or the type of changes that need to happen to get, regain that credibility with a huge section of the country. Margaret, what's your view on, on what uh, Molly's saying? Do, do, you see, do you see authoritarian tendencies from Trump, or is that an example of a, of a journalist freak out uh, when it comes to this new president? Brian, there's definitely reason to be concerned. Um, I think we're in for at least a somewhat combative relationship with the Trump administration. He's made his uh, scorn for the press uh, centerpiece of his campaign and his time during the transition. So I think there is a lot to be concerned about. The thing that you know I'd like to stress is that the press here does represent the public. And so it's not really about where the press is going to sit and whether there's going to be enough room in a particular briefing room and all of that. It's about the press being the representatives of the people. And to the extent that we can uh, drive that message home, I think it will be very important and it's very true. Molly, you have a more conservative uh, audience of the Federalist. I think your inbox is different from mine. You know, Margaret's describing uh, how we do represent the audience, the public. I get a ton of emails from, from viewers right now asking us to hold this new president accountable, hoping that CNN and other outlets like it will stand up to this president. I think your inbox is different, right? Molly, what are you hearing from your audience? Well, I know enough since people tag us both on Twitter to know that your inbox is a little different, too. You're getting a lot of people who are complaining that the media are unnecessarily hostile to them, their way of life, their views, the things they care about and value. And this is something that's been going on for decades. So when they see Donald Trump fight back against the media, it makes them feel like he's fighting back for them. And that's why this whole conversation is happen happening in the context of a larger media environment that has been very unfair. There is a reason why our ratings are so low, our credibility ratings, our trust worthiness ratings and our favorability ratings. They're low because people don't trust us to do a good job of accurately reflecting the views of a huge swath of the country. And there, there's no reason to deny that. We're not doing a good job. And, and so if we want to represent the people, we need to start representing the people. We need to have newsrooms full of diverse voices and having different arguments make it into news stories. We are not doing a great job with that right now. And it's causing us major problems, again, that Donald Trump is able to exploit. And that's dangerous because the media are important for holding all politics accountable. Brian, Let me get I'd David like Zerwick in here. Brian, Brian, yeah, you know, Brian, both sides of this are, are correct. I'm sitting here and thinking both sides are true. Jeffrey's absolutely right. Mm. You move the press out of there, it's beyond optics. It's deep cultural symbolism. The representatives yeah. of the people moved literally off. But you know what? President Obama did a lot of this himself. He limited the photography from inside the White House from independent sources. That's number one. He did all the things that Trump is uh, taking to the exponential level now of trying to go around the press talking to alternative sources. And I think there's, some, there's truth to what Molly says as well in terms of the kind of coverage during this election. You know, if you think back to the CNC, CNBC debate where mm -hmm. the first question from John Harwood is, isn't this a cartoon campaign? That was sub that press, some people in the press were thinking that way, Brian, and it was a brilliant campaign that Trump was running. He was spending almost no money, he was using social media, he was using television, but yet we were, came at him at that tone. A lot of us in the media wanted yeah. to ridicule him. So two things, one, he absolutely uh, does need the press as an enemy, so he's going to do things to infuriate us to his base, just as Molly said. And it's not justified. We have to stop add, him before the, uh, he moves him out. Yeah. That's the most important part of the Esquire story from overnight. There's a quote from an unnamed senior transition source saying, the media is the opposition party. Uh, yes. That's what, that's maybe the Trump view. I asked Sean Spicer. Spicer said, I respect the role of the media in a democracy, but that unnamed quote is crucial. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, I'm almost out of time, but last word to you. What are you telling your journalists at The Atlantic with regards to all of this we're talking about here? Uh, well, the general instruction, I think, is, uh, you know, we're not here to take cheap shots. If there are hard shots that are justified by the facts, take the hard shot. Uh, mm. I'm telling them that, uh, you know, 
Access is important. I want to interview people. I want to cover these people fairly, but uh, we're not going to beg for access. We're going to just cover things as fairly uh, as we can. And uh, I think, you know, we're talking about something that's still theoretical. He's not president yet. So I don't want to go into this conversation about authoritarianism quite yet because we, it's all it's all prospective. And, and so let's just take this one day at a time and cover this White House uh, vigorously the way we would cover any White House.